You know those moments when you're listening to the radio and suddenly something will stop you in your tracks? Well, I had one of my own recently. I just find it extraordinary that we're sitting on this information. The interview was with a psychologist, Kimberly Wilson, who was talking about the connection between our diets and our brains. I think we become so separated from food that we don't consider on a daily basis that it's literally what we're made of. And it turns out what also influences how we think, feel and behave. There's a growing body of evidence showing the role of specific nutrients, compounds and microbes, all essential to our brain function. Some you'll probably know, such as iodine and omega-3 fatty acids. Others are less familiar, such as choline and the bacterium Biflongum. The problem is, Kimberly went on to explain, our diets are deficient in many of these. Fundamentally, right from the beginning, your brain is struggling. And this is a message that I... As I listened, I thought about the reports of increasing levels of depression and anxiety. Also, the performance of children in schools and the impact of dementia on so many families across the UK. If we know so much, why does it seem we're doing so little to ensure everyone is feeding their brains? Listening to Kimberly talking, my own anxiety levels were increasing. And a voice in my head was shouting, something must be done. At the lack of urgency around this, Kimberly uses the analogy of an earthquake. If we all knew the risk of a major seismic event was high, we'd all want to live in houses designed and built to be resilient to future shocks. So if science is telling us we could be feeling happier, more focused, more productive, why are so few of us actively eating to feed our brains? This is really unlike any other feature of health that we'll come across. So with physical health, we, for example, teach children to brush their teeth to prevent caries and tooth decay. And we tell people not to smoke so that they don't develop or reduce their risk of developing lung cancer. But with mental health, we wait for the disaster to strike first. We wait for the depression to hit, we wait for the panic attack, we wait for some kind of burnout or distress, and then we say, oh, okay, let's try and get you back to baseline, or just get you well enough to get back to work. And, and for me, that's the equivalent of, you know, after an earthquake strikes, just kind of painting over the cracks and putting everybody back in the house and hoping it, it all works out. We know that the stresses will come, and what we need to do is to have buildings that are resilient and that can withstand them. And so that's the analogy I use for mental health. So I've recruited Kimberly on a mission. Think of this as an essential guide to some of the science and also some of the big questions. Why is there an emphasis on obesity but so little on nutrition in the brain? And with the science we have, can more be done? Kimberly? Well, I think of course more can be done. And I think if COVID showed us anything, it's that when there is enough of a sense of urgency, then we can find the political will and the kind of alacrity and the policy to make changes almost overnight if we need to. So it's absolutely possible and we've seen that. So in this programme, we're going to hear from a range of experts, people who've spent long careers thinking about food and the brain and what we can do to be the best versions of ourselves. First stop, a scientist who first appeared on the food programme in the 1980s talking about this very issue. In Japan, the women have been eating fish and seafood every day of the week, sometimes more than twice a day. They have produced babies that have grown up of the greatest longevity, the least amount of depression, the least heart disease. We've got to address... In fact, it was back in the early 1970s, Professor Michael A. Crawford was writing about the impact of lower levels of fish and seafood in many diets around the world and a falling consumption of omega-3 fatty acids, such as DHA. He's now in his 90s and still working in this field, still a visiting professor at Imperial College London. And Kimberly, you were keen that we heard from Michael. I think of Professor Crawford really as the canary in the coal mine on these issues. He has been talking about this for 50 years. And what he did as a researcher in fatty acids and their impact on the brain, he looked at the data and he kind of followed it forward and said, if we don't get a grip on this soon, we're heading straight for disaster. And many people would say that we've already hit that tipping point. But 
Professor Crawford has really been kind of ringing the alarm on this for a very long time. The work we did in the 1970s made it robustly clear that the brain required a thing called docosahexanoic acid, or DHA, for its signaling systems. And it really starts 600 million years ago when docosahexanoic acid was used by the very first animals that it evolved when oxygen became available. And that started the evolution of the nervous system and hence the evolution of the brain. And it is totally irreplaceable. And the main source of this is in the marine food web. The modern intensification of agriculture has led to a, a, basically a savanna type diet that doesn't contain all that much THA. There's almost negligible amounts uh, there's almost nothing coming from intensively reared food system, mm -hmm. which we mostly rely on today. This is because no government has any recommendation about the nutrition of the brain in its food and agricultural policies. It's as simple as that. What do you expect, or perhaps what do you predict, is the effect of the loss of these nutrients from our diets on either our brain structure or its function? Because the hexanoic acid is involved with the most important signaling systems of the brain that enable you to think, uh, to see, to hear, to touch, to feel, or so do whatever it is you want to do. It, that's all done through the hexanoic acid and the signaling systems of the brain. So if you don't have enough of that, you're going to lose out in your cognition and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And there was a very good study done in the Bristol region, and what they did was to examine the diet of mothers, over 14,000 mothers during the pregnancy, and then they looked at the psychological and other measures of the children at eight years of age. And what they found was that there was a straight line relationship between the amount of fish and seafood that the mother ate during the pregnancy and verbal reasoning power, a bunch of behavioral scores and motor scores. And the mothers who did not eat much in the way of fish and seafood had the worst outcomes. I think one of the things that is quite difficult with a lot of seafood at the moment is the expense, and especially yeah. when we find ourselves in the middle of a cost of living or poverty crisis. I mean, some of the simplest forms of, of seafood are the cheapest, like mackerel, uh, sardines, mussels, cockles and whelks, alive, alive, whole. We have animal data, we have human, human data. data of the essential need for these fats and other nutrients for brain development, yeah. verbal reasoning, IQ, motor ability. You first wrote about this in the 70s. Yes. I'm dismayed by the fact that not only me, myself, but many others have been involved in trying to get something done about this in terms of nutrition in the brain. And it's been basically falling on deaf ears. The one good thing that has happened is that the brain awareness people in the European Union in March this year came out with a, a, a stunning statement saying, hey guys, we've got to wake up. Um, that we now have a, a global crisis in brain health. So at last somebody is talking about it. Quite extraordinary. The brain has been completely neglected. Mm. The fact of the matter is that mental ill health has been going through the roof. It's been escalating since 1950. Absolutely. Uh, Not just that, but also in the UK, our leading causes of disability and death are brain related. So you have yeah. depression, which is one of, if not the leading cause of disability. Yeah. And then our leading cause of death in the UK is dementia. Yeah. And most of dementia is sporadic. It's not, it's not driven by genetics. It's driven by bad luck, of course, but also lifestyle yeah. and, and nutrition. Yeah. Are you angry? Yes. I'm angry about the fact that nobody is doing anything that is affecting the intelligence and ability and health of the children that are being born. And I have just two great-grandchildren recently born. Congratulations. And, and this is, you know, this is the logical consequence of increasing mental ill health. The logical consequence of diminishing IQ is the finish of humanity. If there was something 
that you could do, what would be the single thing you would do that would improve the situation as it stands? Education. The information that people grow up with now is negligible and they rely on what they hear from advertisements and uh, media. And people who are in charge of the food companies uh, have never been educated with regard to the significance of nutrition and brain health. And my first step of call would be to reintroduce into the school a proper nutritional course. That would be my first step. I was really struck by his anger. If we sit on this evidence and do nothing, it's a kind of negligence, it's a dereliction of duty. And I think it's very difficult for him, having done the research and seen the outcomes, to just watch your work kind of fall away to nothing. Recent studies into omega-3 fatty acids confirm the importance of DHA, and not only in the development of young brains, but also its importance as we age. Take one of the most complex physical actions we do, walking. One of the predictors of risk of dementia is a slowing down in our walking speed. For a study, Dr. Simon Dial, a nutritional neuroscientist at the University of Roehampton, took a large group of women, all over 60. Half of them received omega-3 fatty acids, the other half a placebo. And over this time, you expect a slow decline in walking speed. So in our group that got the placebo, there was the expected decline. But those that took the omega-3 capsules, their walking speed was faster at the end than the beginning. So the difference between those that had the active ingredient and those that had the placebo was about 0.07 meters per second, which is clinically significant. Is the difference to being able to get across the crossing while it's still flashing. So the quality of life has improved. So, Kimberly, omega-3 fatty acids, not just for the young brain. Absolutely. And I think we need to be thinking about this across the lifespan, that protection of the brain is a long game. It starts early, but it has these long-reaching effects. So we need to start thinking about protecting brain health so that we are reducing our rates of things like neurocognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, which are our leading causes of death in the UK. But how does it work? What's the mechanism by which these omega-3 fatty acids influence our brain function? The answer, well, it's complicated. Dr. Simon Dial. So one of the, the issues we have with omega-3s is that they work on so many different fundamental mechanisms. They are an important part of the, the cell membrane. 50 to 60 percent of the brain is made of fat, and of that, about 10 to 12 percent is of this DHA. We've also shown they're involved in a process called neurogenesis. So this is making new brain cells. They're also important for chemicals that help support the brain, called neurotrophins, and they're involved in gene regulation. We also know they have an important role in turning off inflammation. And we know that with dementia and aging, there's a, a very high inflammation component to this. So they are fundamental at many different levels. Kimberly, inflammation, can you help us better understand that term? It's a normal immune response and it's absolutely necessary to help you recover from whatever that insult is. However, Certain lifestyle factors, certain long-term illnesses, certain conditions, chronic stress, for example, can leave that inflammation switched on. And when it's left on for a long time, then it can start to cause kind of havoc in the body. And it also brings in the omega-3s. And as far as we know that for any kind of inflammation, omega-3 fatty acids are required to switch it off. So it had been thought that inflammation was like a fire that just grew up and then gently died down when it ran out of fuel. But that's absolutely not the case. Inflammation is much more like a light switch that once you've turned it on, you have to actively turn it off. And the, the switch that turns it off are derivatives of omega-3 fatty acids. So if you're not getting enough of those, you can't turn off your inflammation. The impact of inflammation and the role of omega-3 fatty acids in diets is being studied by Alessandra Borsini, a senior research fellow at King's College. And one particular focus is depression. So far we know that up to one third of depressed patients do not respond to antidepressant treatment. And what is very interesting is that among these patients who are not responsive to treatment, we know that the majority of them seems to have higher level 
of inflammation in their body. We know that inflammation can detrimentally affect the generation of new neurons, and this process may occur in the hippocampus. This area is relevant in the context of memory, cognition, learning, but also for mood, and that's why it has been kind of extensively studied, especially over the past few years, for its role in the context of neuropsychiatric and particularly depressive symptoms. In her lab, Alessandra took brain cells and exposed them to inflammatory conditions. So, in a way, she created depression in a dish. When omega-3 fatty acids were added, the inflammation reduced. This effect seems to be mediated by production of a specific metabolites, which are basically molecules produced by our body upon receiving omega-3 fatty acid. The next step was to use omega-3 fatty acids in a group of patients suffering from depression. Again, the results highlighted the importance of diet on the brain. Higher the level of these metabolites, lower the depressive symptoms in these patients. And if you look through the Food Programme archive, we've many examples of research showing the importance of food on mood and behaviour. One example is from 2005. A winner of a BBC Food and Farming Award that year for outstanding work was Dr. Bernard Gesh, a senior research scientist at the University of Oxford, and he increased the amount of vitamins, minerals and omega-3 fatty acids being consumed by teenagers in Aylesbury Young Offenders Institute. The effect was quite remarkable. The active group reduced their offending overall by 35%. And at the same time, the placebo group showed absolutely no change in their behavior whatsoever. We had a reception at the House of Lords, and we were delighted to invite some of the prison officers who so kindly helped with the trial. And they actually said that they realized long before our statisticians had reached their conclusions that the trial had worked. Because after we'd left and the supplementation had discontinued, the assaults on officers went up by about 40%. And I always felt very sad that the prison service didn't really take notice of what they were saying, because in essence, you know, this approach could not only reduce the distress and disruption among the prisoners, but result in less staff being injured. Now, Kimberly, the Home Office told us there is no policy in place in the prison system to use supplements to influence the behaviour of inmates. And you've worked in prisons and you're still following this research. It was the replication of this study that I first heard of when I was working in prison. So after Dr. Gesh's study was published, a few years later, the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands did a replication and found very impressively and very unusually the same magnitude of effect. And I have interviewed Dr. Gesh and I asked him kind of a similar question to Professor Crawford, which is, how do you feel about the fact that nothing has been done? And he'd said, you know, he hadn't quite hung up his boots just yet, but he said, if, when you keep banging your head against a brick wall, at some point, you just get tired and have a headache. This is good quality work, and it's still not been acted upon. And at that point, they start asking themselves, well, what do you need to see? How much more evidence? What do you... Tell me what you need and I will go off and do it. Because at this point, the researchers, they're telling me this isn't about the evidence. It's not about a lack of evidence. Something else is getting in the way of the implementation of the outcomes of this research. So what is getting in the way? One of the leading researchers on food and the brain is Professor Felice Jacker, co-director of the Food and Mood Centre at Deakin University in Australia. We caught up with her at an event organised for GPs to learn more about the connection between food and the brain, during which she presented some of the latest research findings. What she believes is getting in the way is the modern global food system in which more populations around the world are dependent on processed foods, lacking in these essential brain nutrients. The less processed, more whole foods we need, she argues, isn't where the money is. The big losers are generally industry and those making a profit from these ultra-processed foods that interact with all those reward systems of the brain. They seem to bypass our natural appetite regulation systems. One of the studies I talked about today, there's been two actually in Australia where young, healthy people put onto a Western-type diet just for a few days 
have um, detriments to their the parts of their learning and memory that are linked to this key region of the brain called the hippocampus that we've already shown is smaller in people who have an unhealthier diet. And this is one of the other things. We need to understand how this is working. What we know is that diet affects all of these different systems that are in turn in, involved in um, mental health problems such as depression. So things like our immune system and oxidative stress, our neurotransmitter systems, our brain plasticity and that bit of the brain I mentioned, the hippocampus, the way our genes turn on and off, our um, mitochondria in our cells, very importantly, the microbes that live in our gut and, and probably in our mouth and lungs as well. All of these things interact with mental and brain health as well as you know the health of our whole body and they're all working together synergistically if diet influences all of those factors and all of those factors influence mental and brain health well we see how these things might be working and that helps people to understand and make it concrete i guess i think at this stage there is you know, maybe a little bit of confusion, some unsureness, some, maybe some valid scepticism about whether this isn't just all correlation and how much evidence we have to demonstrate a relationship between diet and, and mental health outcomes. Nutritional psychiatry is a relatively new field, just over a decade or so old, but we already have a very large and consistent body of evidence from right across the world, whether it's Japan or Norway or China or Australia or where have you, that people who have a healthier diet tend to have a lower risk of developing depression. And in some studies, I've looked at anxiety as well. It's not explained by socioeconomic status, so education, income. It's not explained by body weight, very important. It doesn't seem to be explained by reverse causality. That means people eating differently because of their mental health problems. And we see it from the very start of life right through to the end of life. But we also now have some clinical trials. So in our trial, which was the first randomised control trial, we recruited people with moderate to severe clinical major depressive disorder. Many of them had been very sick for a long time. Most of them were on other forms of treatment. It's important to say it's not an either or. Um, and we randomly assigned them to receive either social support, which we know is really helpful for people with depression, or dietary support from a clinical dietitian. Those who got the dietary support were just um, supported to make changes to their diet, increase the intake of um, plant foods, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, but very importantly, reducing junk processed foods, ultra processed foods. And what we saw at the end of that study was a very, very pronounced impact on the mental health of people who got the dietary support that tracked very closely to how they changed their diet. So basically, the more they improved their diet, the more their depression improved. Our diet was actually cheaper because we're not saying it needs to be organic this and fancy that. It's like frozen vegetables, tinned and dried beans, legumes, tinned fish. All of these things are great often very simple to prepare and not expensive. So it's very achievable and people really seem to love the idea that this is something that they can do for themselves. Kimberly, what did you make of Felice's research and the conclusions she was reaching? I think it's really interesting that you have a researcher take such a strong view. Again, with this group of professionals, they are seeing firsthand the impact of poor nutrition, poor diet quality on these outcomes for their patients and participants and how easily, cheaply, safely things could be improved, really, if we all just got our act together. OK, well, we've heard a lot about omega-3 fatty acids and the importance of whole foods, green vegetables and legumes. An ingredient now understood to be important for brain health is one we can't even see microbes. Over to Professor Dynan, a psychiatrist at University College Cork. It's his research that led to the term psychobiotics being coined, the application of which, for example, is using particular strains of bacteria to reduce stress. Many listeners will have heard of cortisol as a stress hormone. It's the main stress hormone in humans. When we're stressed, our cortisol levels go up. And uh, when we're less stressed, they come down. And what we and others have shown is that certain microbes can actually inhibit that stress system. 
Now, that stress system is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That's the axis that produces cortisol. And what, what certain microbes can do is they can suppress this axis and reduce the output of cortisol. You know, as a psychiatrist, I prescribe medication. I use cognitive behavior therapy. But I constantly advocate two things for patients. One, that they have a better diet and they reduce the intake of fast food because fast or highly processed foods is bad for your mental health. It's not just cross-sectional data. This is data based on longitudinal follow-up of, of individuals. And secondly, that they exercise. And there's no doubt about it, a better diet with less processed foods and regular exercise are the key to better management of stress. Professor Ted Dynan there. When we asked the Department of Health and Social Care what work was underway specifically on diets and brain health, they pointed us to the Eat Well guidelines, which features mostly unprocessed foods and includes oily fish and green leafy vegetables. They also added that there isn't currently enough evidence to support a relationship between diet and the prevention of dementia, although this position is based on research published five years ago. Now, Kimberly, I wanted to make this program because I felt we needed a greater sense of urgency around food in the brain, and more of us need access to this information and to be talking about it and cooking and eating in a different way. It's difficult for many of us to make the necessary changes. We're subject to food environments we're not in huge control over, and there's Felice Jacker's point about the global food system. But you are still optimistic. We can all act to better feed our brains. It's really, really kind of mind-bending, the idea that your food might be shaping your behaviour, that the thing that you ate last might be influencing how you relate to somebody else, how sensitive you are to a criticism, how able you are to concentrate. It really starts to question some of the fundamental ideas about who we are and how we come to be who we are. Just because something is difficult, challenging, confronting doesn't give us the permission to ignore it and just carry on as if we don't know. Thanks, Kimberly. I don't know about you, but I'm off to eat some mussels. <laughs> Me too. Hi, Greg. Hi, Slice Bread team. I wonder if you can help me. I'm Greg Foote, and my podcast, Slice Bread, is back to run a whole new batch of promising-sounding wonder products through the evidence mill. I'm quite a snorer. Just wondered if there's a product that could mean I could still have a pint on a Friday and not snore. Do these toothpaste do what they say on the label? Is paying more for expensive shampoo really worth it? Each week, I investigate one of your suggested wonder products, something that's promising to make you happier, healthier or greener. I chat to the experts and find out if it is indeed the best thing since sliced bread or, and this is catching on now, marketing BS. So if you have a suggestion or if you'd like to go and listen to the now 60 plus previous episodes covering everything from collagen to CBD, and sourdough to sunglasses. Just go search for sliced bread on BBC Sounds. Mm-hmm.